Today, I'm setting out to catch a thief. I just don't know who exactly. Allow me to set the scene of the crime. I was at work, innocently YouTubing away, when I went to the break room and there I saw it. An empty space where my personal bag of ketchup chips, clearly labeled with my name, should have been. The most likely culprit is Melissa, the only other person I've seen at work today, and I'm prepared to catch her red-handed. But in the very small, truly minuscule chance that I'm wrong, Getting into a fight with a coworker could be dicey if they are actually innocent. Now I'm facing the biggest dilemma of my life. I want justice, so I'm going to need to evaluate all of the evidence, make a decision, and live with the consequences either way. Hi, I'm Sabrina Cruz, and this is Study Hall, the case of the missing chips. Uh, real world statistics. Statistical investigations assume you're innocent until proven guilty. Unfortunately for me and my quest to catch this chip thief red-handed, that means I first have to assume that Melissa is not the crook until I have enough evidence to refute that assumption. That starting point is our null hypothesis. It's an assumption that nothing special is happening and that nothing is wrong, different, or has changed. Like we've discussed in other episodes, we use statistical investigations to decide if we should reject the null hypothesis. So we're on the hunt for evidence. I'm talking crumb suspiciously red chip dust covered fingers, the satisfied smile of someone who just ate a delicious snack that should have been mine. We can think of this evidence as analogous to the test statistic. That's the numerical value we calculate based on our sample data, and it's used to mount our evidence against the null hypothesis. Here, that's Melissa being innocent of the chip crime. A few crumbs per cubicle is to be expected, but if there are a lot more than I expect to see on Melissa's desk, and they are clearly ketchup chip colored, that seems extra suspicious. Turning the test statistic into a decision requires us to go through the p-value. Remember, that's the probability of obtaining a result as extreme or more extreme than those we observed, assuming our null hypothesis that Melissa did not steal my chips is true. If the p-value is small, that means that what I observed, the red crumbs for instance, is super unlikely if the null hypothesis that Melissa is innocent was true. That suggests that there is strong evidence against the null, which means I might seriously suspect my thieving colleague, who I once thought I could trust. If the p-value is large, though, Melissa is looking more and more safe from suspicion. That large p-value means that what I observed wouldn't be that uncommon if the null hypothesis was true, which doesn't give me a lot of evidence to overturn that initial hypothesis. To make a decision, we often have a cutoff p-value in mind. Before we start collecting data, we decide how unlikely something would have to be for us to consider it too unlikely. That cutoff probability is called the significance level, or the alpha level, and we usually use values like 5% or 1%. If the p-value we get from our test is less than our alpha level, we reject the null hypothesis. If our p-value is greater than our alpha level, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We do not prove the null hypothesis, we just fail to reject it. Making a decision and accusing your cubicle neighbor of grand theft snack can feel great, but almost immediately we need to consider the consequences of making the wrong one. Because here's the thing, stats can go wrong. Like what if we decide that my coworker Melissa is guilty of the ketchup chip caper, meaning that we rejected the null hypothesis, but she wasn't actually the culprit. Rejecting the null hypothesis when it is actually true is called a type one error or a false positive. The consequences of this kind of error can vary a lot. In this case, if I accuse Melissa when she really didn't do it, that could strain our working relationship. In a more formal justice system situation, that would mean that an innocent person is convicted. For another real life high stakes example, it could mean that researchers conclude that a new drug is effective when in reality, it doesn't actually help solve a problem. Take the oral use of phenylephrine, a popular decongestant common in Sudafed and other over-the-counter cough and cold products. In 2023, an expert panel concluded that the current recommended dose of phenylephrine doesn't actually work to relieve congestion. The drug developers made a type 1 error. They rejected their null hypothesis, so they said that phenylephrine was effective when really it wasn't. Major yikes. But good news, there are other ways things can go terribly wrong. We could also make the opposite mistake, like failing to recognize the effectiveness of a life-saving treatment because researchers felt a study didn't provide enough evidence. Or in my case, I might fail to reject the null hypothesis that my coworker Melissa is innocent, but she actually did eat my chips. Failing to reject the null hypothesis when it is actually false is called a type two error or a false negative. In our scenario, the consequence of this kind of 
error would mean that the true ketchup chip consumer would get away with the crime. And in higher stakes situations, false negatives can suck too. Think about a COVID test right before you see your grandma. Now, unlike ketchup chips, all of these consequences are pretty unappealing, which is why it's nice to know how likely these errors are so we can get them under control. We actually do know what the probability of making a type one error is and have some control over it. It's the alpha level. So if we choose alpha as 0.05, we have a 5% chance of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is actually true, which as a reminder is a world where Melissa did not steal my chips. If we really don't wanna make this kind of error, we can just choose to make our alpha level much smaller. That's like raising our standards, requiring even stronger evidence before overturning the null hypothesis and making it less likely that we wrongly convict someone. And actually, we see this done in practice often. Like in the justice system, someone must be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt before we feel comfortable rejecting the null hypothesis that they are innocent. However, there's no free lunch except for whoever took my ketchup chips. Decreasing the probability of a type one error increases the probability of a type two error, which is often denoted as beta. The type two error depends on a lot more than just the probability of a type one error decreasing. So there's no one size fits all formula for computing it. Each scenario is different and specific elements matter for a type two error. Now, a lot can go wrong in statistical tests, but a lot can also go right. Power represents the probability of correctly rejecting the null hypothesis hypothesis if a specific alternative hypothesis is true. And that's a good thing. It means we're capturing a real difference and getting closer to understanding the truth. So if my search for who stole my ketchup chips resulted in me accusing Melissa and she actually is the chip stealer, that would be an event that counts toward the power. We want this kind of scenario to be very likely. Sorry, Melissa. Now we want power to be high because we want to do the right thing, but power is also related to our probability of making a type two error, beta. Power is equal to one minus beta. So if power goes up, beta goes down, which means there's less chance of getting a false negative. The power of a study is related to the sample size, which is an element of the scenario that we have control over, at least, in theory. Having access to more data can help increase the power of a study and decrease the probability of a type 2 error. The more information we have in a sample, the more precise our estimates are, and that helps us feel more secure in our decisions. But we can't always increase the sample size. As much as I would love to spend the whole day snooping around the office for evidence to see who owes me a bag of ketchup chips, I have a video to make. And that's the same in lots of scenarios. Data collection is expensive and time-consuming, so we need to balance our desire to get things right while also being realistic about what we can and can't do. We can't eliminate all errors completely, so we're tasked with balancing type 1 and type 2 errors. And depending on the context, we might prefer being wrong in one direction more than the other. Like, after much soul searching, I've decided I'd rather someone get away with it than accuse someone who didn't. I favored a type 2 error over a type 1 error. There's always another bag of ketchup chips, but it's harder to mend a broken, ketchup-splattered relationship. Still, what if we're searching for a drug that improves on the current medication for acid reflux? So, for example, I can keep consuming as many ketchup chips as I want, or even more life-changing, a drug that cures cancer. We might prefer concluding that a potentially life-saving drug is effective when in reality it has no effect, rather than pass on a treatment that actually does have a helpful effect. Most people would probably agree that taking a pill that does nothing is better than missing out on a chance to cure cancer. In other words, we'd all sacrifice an increased probability of a type 1 error for a decrease in the probability of a type 2 error. Even that decision isn't so black and white, though, because the drug that doesn't end up doing anything could also cause other issues or be very very expensive. I might prefer to save that money for snacks, acid reflux be damned. Basically, it's complicated. It comes down to a judgment call, and that's why we need to think carefully about the problem at hand, consider all of the consequences of possible decisions, and weigh the evidence carefully. Still, knowing more about errors and the way stats can go awry is also really helpful. We constantly see announcements and big discoveries and groundbreaking research, but knowing more about errors in statistics can help us be more critical when we hear about these studies and breakthroughs. Like if we see a headline that overturns conventional wisdom, like exercise fails to decrease 
increase blood sugar levels for people with diabetes, but in the fine print that conclusion was only made with four data points, we might be worried that we are in a type 2 error territory. Let's be real, no one likes making mistakes, and that is especially true when we are answering important questions. Knowing what kinds of mistakes that we can make, how likely they are, and what steps we can take to minimize the chances of us being wrong can help us weigh the consequences and make a final decision. There's always a trade-off between rejecting our initial hypothesis when we shouldn't and failing to reject when we actually should. We can't completely eliminate both types of mistakes, so we have to make hard choices once we've considered all of the information we have. Like in the case of the missing ketchup chips, I've decided that it's better to let things go than make a mistake that has bigger consequences. I like my coworkers. I don't want to lose any friends over this. So I'll just eat my other bag of ketchup chips. I have plenty. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall real world statistics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment how you would deal with a snack thief, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.